Okay, so we got the three hat men here. All three of us are yeah. hatting it up. I got some nice hats to give you guys. I got to hook up with you yeah, guys to hat. give you hats. You know what, Ryan? Before you sail out, you got to get hats. I got hats. <laughs> okay, I'll make it work. Okay, yeah, yeah, like yeah make hat. sure. I mean, it's. I don't like the style of it. I like the original baseball cap. This one's like the flat, flat one. Yeah, whatever. yeah, that's like a that's a hat with some girth on it, you know? It's like almost like made of cardboard on the top. It's like hard, right? I know, I know. I don't like that style at all. But my daughter took my other hat. She refused to take it off. Yeah, well, that's pretty cute. So I don't blame her. So uh, she wears it backwards. She wears it like she wears it like this, and then puts sunglasses on. Yeah, that's cute, dude. Kids are so freaking cute. And you know, I lately I've been like kind of thinking do i really do i want another kid and i'm like yes because they're so cute and then i'm like no because i like sleeping so it's kind <laughs> of like a toss-up they're so freaking cute but i really like sleeping well you could you could train the sleep thing into it within about a month four to five so you're gonna have four to five months of the uh you know what I mean, your wife's gonna have it more than you because she's breastfeeding so i mean like but otherwise yeah. like our daughter we put her down at 7 7 30 and she's out till seven in the morning so but she did we put her in a crib and she's she's out you know like it's we have our, our time but we it, we did a bunch of training to do that mm. so you can have kids and but it, it just you know to find ways to be at cause of the situation because i mean otherwise they'll just run your life and they'll run your sleep and they'll run everything unless you run it yourself pretty smart strategy sleep training wasn't really a thing when our kids were 11 and 13 and like i just i don't know i feel like we were like just getting like social media was like really just kicking into gear and there wasn't as much content obviously um instagram wasn't really popular yet and I, we didn't have a huge amount of like, there's huge influencers now that will teach you everything about how to make dog food all the way to like how to feed your baby homemade food, right? And that stuff just wasn't super available when we had our kids, you know? So I think all I got to do is go on Instagram or whatever and like find some TikTokers or whatever and, and just basically follow their routines. And I bet you would. It, it would be a lot easier and I'd feel a lot less like doing it by myself, you know? Yeah, that's true. I mean, that's definitely uh, what helped us a lot is the, uh, well, I mean, you have all these groups now and Facebook and whatever that you get a lot of information on how people do things. Yeah, exactly. Speaking of how people do things, I just made my first terribly done batch of soda stream. You know, soda stream. No, oh, yeah. yeah. Why? Why is it terrible? No, I did a bad job. I I didn't put enough water in it. It was like too low. Uh, so then, when I hit the compressor, like it had air between the tip of the compression thing and the water, oh, and it just went crazy, crazy, and it like went all over my my uh, kitchen. Um, yeah. So I kind of made it work because I was in a rush. So there's some I got to do it again. But basically, you know, the first batch on any new machine is your worst batch right so but my whole thing with the soda stream is again on amazon i bought it on amazon because i spend uh, who knows how much per year on seltzer water like we love seltzer water because we we uh -huh. intermittent fast so like all we drink all day is seltzer water because it makes you feel more full right so i was like so sick of buying Lacroix and and spin drifts and they're like seven, six, seven dollars. And I'm like, so I bought a soda stream and it was like a hundred bucks. And you just have, all you have to do is buy the cartridge every few months. The CO2 cartridge. Where do you cartridge. buy the cartridge from? From the from Amazon. Oh, from Amazon. And you return the old one way to Amazon. To Amazon. That's amazing. Yeah. So it's like, and all you have to do is just take this bottle which they provide you, they provide fill you. purified water to the line. You can even add a little flavoring if you want, which I think is bullshit. I'd rather just do fresh lime or whatever. And then put it up to the machine, hit the button three times for light, five times for 
medium and seven times for like really bubbly. And then you're done and you just take it off, close the cap. And now you have like a whole thing of seltzer water. Mm. I feel like we just did a whole commercial for soda stream. Yeah. But just think about how badass that is. It's very cool. And the fact that you can return it to Amazon. <laughs> yeah. It's and very pe cool. people, people make soda. There's, there's like little soda, uh, packets you can put in where you can put in Coke, root beer. I've seen that, but I mean, what about the, the benefits of all these other waters is that it's like, uh, you know, super healthy and no sugar and blah, blah, blah. Do you get any of those little things right. that you put in that is like super healthy and all that kind of stuff? Yeah. I'm probably going to put in electrolytes when I make it. So, wouldn't ah. that be awesome? Like an electrolyte fizzy water. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. That makes you sense. Know what? They actually don't sell a product like that on the, the market, like a soda electrolyte. I mean, do, is there, is there a product like that that exists? Like you can just buy I'm not aware of. soda electrolytes well, like in a can. The easy thing is on Amazon, there's a thing called a search engine soda electrolyte electrolyte soda. But I, there's soda. definitely no one that I can think of offhand. That's like conquering. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Energy drink mix electrolyte. No, there's no conquering. Taste may be an issue because you know electrolytes are slightly salty, and maybe that mixed with bubbles and everything. Maybe it's not quite. Maybe the it forms regular. like a chemical reaction and it explodes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like sodium with sodium with bubbles equals death. <laughs> yeah, like equals explosion. Like it'll like, like the seagull. Like when you feed seagulls, uh, what is it, tums or something? You know, they explode. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that'll happen in your stomach. That's funny. Yeah, well, yeah. See, your your, stom your stomach it. lining just rips apart and melts. You're like, "Look, honey," and then you, all of a sudden your guts fly out in the middle of the kitchen. I'm getting a <laughs> little good. overly gross here. <laughs> yeah, that's um, not good. <laughs> yeah. So, the, you know, the, there's been some interesting uh, world news you lately. You can do it. It says. It says you can. You can do electrolytes. That's good. I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna do it, man. I'm gonna take my little soda stream bottle. Put an electrolyte packet in it from just one of the people I like to buy electrolyte from. Make mm -hmm. a seltzer water, and I'll report back to you guys on how it was. Oh, so uh, it does. Yeah. No, sir. It explodes. When you put electrolytes in carbonated water, it explodes. Oh, maybe I won't do it then. Yeah. So it's a catalyst release of the CO2 from the water. So basically, it's like the Diet Coke and Mentos. Oh, really? I thought, I thought that was because Diet Coke and Mentos are both just terrible for you so putting them together equals basically a nuclear bomb of horror but it, yeah no i mean well there is a chemical reaction there's a chemical it. catalyst in the carbonated water with the aspartame or the sugar or whatever it is in there that reacts with the mentos in this case though the electrolytes the sodium act as a catalyst for the co2 in the water which makes it explode therefore they do not sell electrolyte soda because it explodes. I'm gonna figure it out. I'm going into the lab. I'll see you guys in a month. I'm gonna figure right, it out. White. Well, there we go. Let's see what happens. It's a great idea. Um, Someone listening and, uh, to this so, is gonna make a good product out of this. Yeah, exactly. So there's been some world news lately, guys. I got some world news to share with the audience. People want to hear about the news. news. This is. Beep, 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 beep. This is the place to get your world news. Beep, beep, beep. I got the, I got the, uh, what, what is that coming in? The uh, Morse code. Um, so an interesting uh, bit of news here. I'm going to, I'm going to share up my screen. I got a few articles to share with the audience here. Caught at the border with pythons in his pants. What? So I think that's, I think that's a little, I think that's a little weird. Like if you're, it says a New York city man who admitted to smuggling three Burmese pythons in his pants through a U.S. Canadian border. So this dude's coming, uh, I think, from Canada to the U.S. Um, Calvin Batista, 38, crossed into New York with the hidden snakes on a bus from Montreal to New York City. Um, the young adult snakes were hidden in the inner thigh of his pants. So I always think, you know, a snake in your pants has got a different innuendo. This guy had snakes in his pants. <laughs> <laughs> Like for me, it's like normally it's like, is that a snake in your pants or are you happy to see me? But for him, it's actually <laughs> legit snakes in his pants. <laughs> Multiple. 
So he went up to Canada oh, and he was crazy. like, and he bought some, he bought $2,500 worth of snakes at a reptile store in Canada. Um, and they're Burmese pythons. And he's like, I'm just going to put them in my pants. So that way I can get them through the border. Mm. What do you guys think about that? Would you ever smuggle snakes in your pants? <laughs> I wouldn't put a snake in my pants. I would probably <laughs> not smuggle snakes in my pants. I mean, well, so you, I guess you can't. So the moral of the story is you cannot take animals across the border or you need to have paperwork for them. Yeah, there's but a like whole a snake, thing with a, animals. A Burmese python is a common house pet. Yeah, but it's become it's also become a problem here in Florida, right? In the swamp. So, yes, it is a common house pet, but I don't think you can smuggle a snake in your pants over the border without letting them know, hey, I got snakes in my pants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, so you just got to be honest about it. Like, listen, guys, I got snakes in my pants. If you want to check it out, if you want to see it. Ideally, if you have a you know, female uh, Frisker, that would be ideal for my snakes in my pants. But otherwise, you know, I'll take a male, whatever, whatever you got. I bet it. I bet if you were honest about it, they'd like laugh and let you through. They're like, <laughs> he's got snakes in his no, pants. What a funny guy. Obviously, got some issues. He was trying to hide his snakes in his pants. Yeah, I mean the thing but is, I, mean, I guess it depends on the size of the snake. You know, I mean, like if the snake's gonna be, if it's a big snake, he can't hide the snake in your pants. I think these yeah. are babies. But these were young adults. The guy, I mean, the guy should have bought some baby snakes. They were harder to detect. Oh you know, yeah, baby, you're right. Baby pythons are like yeah. this big. They're very small. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, 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 yeah. What, okay, if you had to bring, if you had to smuggle a few snakes, young adult snakes, what would you choose to do? It like, if is the pants your your go to, or would you try something different? Uh, yeah, I mean, if I would think about it, like I would really want to smuggle snakes, I'd put them in a backpack in like a hidden compartment. Um, that's probably what I would do. They're going to search your backpack, but I mean, I don't know if they x-rayed or something. They might They're see. Gonna, I don't know if they x-ray at the border. But you they know, check they back. And if you have like a good backpack with like 30, like a Tumi backpack has like 30 different compartments. They're going to, you know, you have a, and you pile a bunch of stuff in there and it's just, they're going to look through it and be like, cool. It's just like stuff. And also you want to separate the snake. So if they find one, you still got two because yeah, and then like, it's oh, like, I got oh my snake. God, you still got two more. And you'd be like, okay, it's only $2,500 fine for one snake, you know? So that's not as bad. You guys are onto something here. You guys are really onto something. Um, so, in more world news, um, a mummified monkey remains were found in the luggage at Boston's airport. So, Jeez. this is yeah. So, this is another Jeez, situation. Mummified snakes and mummified monkeys. I mean, Jesus, it's yeah. something like like good, you know. I, mean, I guess there's plenty of good smugglers out there, but I mean, smuggling weird animals and dead animals. Yeah so, yeah, so what's the deal with um why tell me why someone would want to to smuggle or even bring in it's not really a smuggle you can't smuggle this this is a massive amount of carcass here okay like why would you want a mummified monkey so is that is is that for your like man cave are you doing like tiki tiki shit outside in your backyard? You're having like a, a luau and you think you need to be kind of jungle friendly. Like what's your reasoning here? I mean, maybe you have a deal with the museum. Yeah, I'm maybe with, you I'm have with Jesus. <laughs> I have yeah, no I don't idea. know. I mean, like, why would you want to size <laughs> mummified monkey? I don't know. That sounds a little a little sketch. I'm, I'm... <laughs> So it says here, the traveler at Boston Logan International Airport said the bag contained dry, dried fish. So that's what he like claimed it. And then upon further examination, airport agents discovered that it was in fact mummified remains, which included heads belonging to four monkeys. The incident took place on Thursday at a security screening for passengers. A canine officer named Buddy, so Buddy the dog, sniffed out the dead and dehydrated monkeys. Imagine that dog's nose, dude. He probably smelt these carcasses from like 3,000 yards away. Like he's like, okay, there's dead monkeys somewhere, right? Like a dog is like trained more than anything to smell animals. So imagine he was probably going ballistic when that dude entered. 
I mean, yeah. They were dehydrated. Um, inside inside luggage. And the dude was returning to the yes from the Congo. So he's at the Congo and he's thinking, man, I love dehydrated mummified monkeys. This would look badass in my man cave. I'm bringing these, I'm bringing these and I'm just going to claim them as dried fish. Hmm. He also carried eight pounds of bush meat. I mean, yes. Yeah, I, I actually, you know what? Listening to this, imagine what it's like to be one of these border control agents dealing with this all day. I mean, that's quite a job. Yeah, that's yeah. quite a job. You know, never mind these guys with these crazy ideas. These guys are their jobs is to to handle this all day long. I know. I mean, you're right. That's that's a that, that's that's quite a job. You, you you know, I think they deserve uh, more recognition than they get. Because they deal with a lot. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> well, let's uh, let, let's talk about the next one here. The next one is, I think, the most crazy of all. So check this out. This just went down in Colorado. So Colorado funeral homeowner gets arrested following the discovery of 190 decaying bodies. Whoa. Yeah. I don't know if you so know Matt, homes, get arrested for the bodies. Could be a hundred decaying bodies. Yeah. So obviously, as a funeral but, but as home a funeral director, home. so don't they have a not, lot? Oh, they just you're not supposed to let them decay. Like you have yeah. very specific rules with how you're supposed to manage a, 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 a dead body, right? A dead body is supposed to stay cold. It's supposed to be embalmed, or it's supposed to be and buried, or it's supposed to be cremated. It's not supposed to just decay. This dude had a hundred and ninety decaying imagine the smell so it says here the owners of a colorado funeral home were arrested wednesday after 200 nearly 200 decaying corpses were found improperly stored at their facility john and carrie halford the owners of the return to nature funeral home i love the name i love it uh wow, were arrested on four <laughs> felony charges so they actually got felony charges including abuse of a corpse did you guys know that that was a, a that was a thing abuse of a corpse I, mean, I know that like um, well i suppose letting it decay digging up graves grave robbing i mean all those are pretty intense charges like messing with corpses in general uh maybe he just overgrew you know like he was uh, able to take on normally five five corpses at a time and then a lot of people died at the same time I and mean, that's kind of probably not politically correct to say but then he was like, I'll take him, you know, let's go. I'll, I'm going to grow this let's business. And then he had 190. He was like, oh, and he couldn't deliver. You know, he was he was selling, selling, selling uh, services, to dead bodies, but he just couldn't deliver that many dead bodies like, that, mm -hmm. you know, cremation and, and um, probably also embalmment. He, he just couldn't do it. That's a lot of, you know, it's too much work. And he probably some people called out sick and then he ended up with 190 dead bodies. And they were just yeah. trying to figure out stuff issues yeah. it, scaling issues supply issues you know all whatever he's got to do to 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 keep the bodies all good like the uh, supply and time <laughs> all these issues you guys would you guys would be garbage right there you guys would be garbage sheriffs garbage <laughs> sheriffs if you guys showed up you'd be like well, he's a nice guy he's got scaling problems like you're just terrible <laughs> sheriffs, okay you know, you'd be like, "Oh, he's just a good guy. He just he couldn't handle so many corpses. He just couldn't he's, he he's, couldn't deliver? That's all. He couldn't he's deliver that many. And, and two hundred people died. Yeah. What's he gonna do? Give the guy a break. Uh, Give him an SBA loan. It's and not let him his fault that that many people, you know, <laughs> passed on in that short a period of time. You know, and that yeah. was the only maybe, facility nearby. He just needs more money. His refrigeration yeah, needs more staff. Bro. He needs more money. He needs that. He needs to be better funded to yeah. handle that many. He needs. Corpses. He needs an SBA loan, and he'll be fine. Uh, yeah. Problem solved. And some employee well, employee what... retention credit because he couldn't keep his employees obviously to embalm all those people. Yeah. So sorry yeah. to sorry to burst your guys bubble is he was also uh, charged with um, theft and money laundering and forgery. So I have a feeling there's a little bit more there than just he has scaling issues. Uh, okay. Well, he accepted the money okay. and he obviously didn't deliver the service, which would be forge forgery, right? It's like if but I, I sold, 
an Amazon service and I couldn't deliver it, you know, I'd be charged with forgery too. So, you know, that's part of what comes with those charges if you accept the corpse and you can't deliver an embalmment or a cremation to the corpse. <laughs> yeah, that's one way to look at it. So investigators originally estimated the 2,500 square foot building contained about 115 bodies. But after transporting all the remains to the El Paso County Coroner's Office, they raised the number first to 189. Then they found another body somewhere and then it went to 190. Um, okay. What if that, what if your job was to go in there and clean up? Just imagine that for a second, like your worst day managing Amazon brands, just pick, compare your worst day managing Amazon brands to go in and clean up rotting corpses. No, they, they're corpses. wearing hazmat suits with like oxygen fed. And I mean, there's no way like that, that, that smell alone, like you'll just <laughs> be gagging on the floor. <laughs> I mean, let's be real about it. Like, there's, there's no way. They're wearing all kinds of stuff. Spraying themselves with disinfectant all the time. I mean, it's a whole thing. There's a whole thing. So I check this out. Out of 190, only mess. 100. Check this out. Only 110 actually were identified using fingerprints and dental records. That's crazy to me. So there's actually 80 bodies. They're like, we don't know who that is. I mean, how bad was is. the smell? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a little odd. I, I at this point, I don't think it's scaling problems anymore. I think he was well. If you can't identify an individual because teeth are missing, fingers are missing. I mean, this guy was obviously abusing the corpses because at this point, he was taking out fingers and taking out teeth, and he was just like, "Ah, I'm having a grand old time." Probably had mason jars with you know fluids in them, preserving that. He was just one of those guys that you see in video games, like in Resident Evil video games or movies, that he was just this really creepy dude. So yeah, I, I thought this article Probably was uh, into worth... necrophilia and all kinds of stuff. He just loved dead bodies that much. Yeah. That's creepy. Yeah, it's, it says here the practice is legal in the United States. Um, let's go back up. Actually, what they found inside was horrific. Um, Al, Alice Alan Cooper, who who's the county sheriff, declined to go into further detail. And then it says, according to the website, Return to Nature offers green and natural burial services. Very, very natural, which allow bodies to decompose underground without the use of metal caskets or chemicals. The practice is legal in the state of Colorado, but the law requires bodies that are not embalmed to be refrigerated. So what these guys were doing, this actually starting to make sense. They were selling a green kind of thing as like, we'll handle it. And they didn't, they, they would, I think they were going to bury these individuals, but because they're green and they don't have to embalm, they got loose. These guys are hippies and they got over hippied and they're like, eh, whatever, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. Cause no one's going to see the body. They're just going to throw it into the dirt without a casket based on what it says here. So improper, improper storage. Mm. Oh, I see. They were intended for natural burial, but they were basically just, they're just stacking bodies, guys. They're, they're just stacking bodies. So they were scaling problems and they were lazy and then they were, yeah. So check That's this out. Kind of some relatives of those who, were, this is funny too. Some relatives of those whose remains were sent to the funeral for cremation told the AP that they believed they were given fake acid composed of dry concrete. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, okay. So they were, yeah, forging. They're basically just taking well, bodies and then just putting them in crazy. holes. Yeah. I know. I know. I got I got one more for you guys before we uh before we jump in to uh any Amazon I think Ryan's already gone. Yeah, it's all good. Ryan had a a client call. Um so here we have Sheriff's Deputy Corral's Wayward Kangaroo near Pool at Florida Apartment Complex. And I you know, I as a Florida resident myself tampa florida i'm wondering why a kangaroo was found here in florida it says here um a wayward kangaroo was corralled safely by sheriff's deputies thursday after it was spotted hopping around the pool area of a, a florida apartment complex the hillsbury county sheriff's office released video and still photos of the kangaroo including some footage shot from a helicopter <laughs> the agency also released audio of a female resident of the complex calling in a report i actually see a kangaroo it's kind of a large kangaroo, the identified woman says. Um, we got him closed in the pool gate area. So they actually closed him in. Here he is. 
How the hell did an Australian kangaroo Elijah probably an escape from the zoo? Kangaroo in the complex. Bravo twenty six. I actually see a kangaroo. It's kind of a large kangaroo. We got it closed into the. Like, yeah, the it's got to be area. from a, a zoo. Someone didn't close the gate, or it hopped over yep. the fence. Yep. That's awesome. Though. I mean, it's you know, out of any out of any animal, you know, this is the least threatening. You know, kangaroo is like no big deal. But he's like looking in the pool. Well, no, I mean, you've seen those videos. They just stand up and they'll fight you. I mean, you don't want to get too close to them. They'll they'll, <laughs> they'll kick you. They'll fight you. They're like MMA animals, basically. It says deputies were able to figure out the animal's owner and reunite them. So it's actually a private owner. Oh, wow. Probably has an exotic animal license. Whoa. But you can Checking get exotic it. animal licenses and import animals. Um, as long as you have like the right habitat for them, lemurs, kangaroos, you know, different from different countries. But what's the? Point, I know a person though? like that that they had an exotic animal license and they would, they had a whole farm of exotic animals, basically like their own little private zoo. Kids loved it. What's the, but what's the point though? Oh, like you have you have kids come and check out your animals. Uh, yeah, I mean, also you just like an animal person. You like exotic animals, you know, from Madagascar, from australia and so you just get an exotic animal license it's not that hard to get I and mean, you just have to have as long as they inspect a habitat for them i mean they're staying with a lot of land and space for them to run around it's totally fine interesting stuff so speaking of exotic what's going on in your world in the amazon world um i definitely have to figure out i actually watch a lot of videos of myself and i always say um i the um is my is my deadly thing and i'm trying to work on the ums it's like the worst thing in the world part of my speech but it's the fill do i do you i, um? do I um? while you're thinking what do i um not nearly as bad as i do i'm the worst ummer i've ever seen on any video i'm i'm the ummer of all ums yeah but at least you're um aware i know i'm very unaware and i'm it's trying to first step um to an umming yeah. Uh, oh, oh. <laughs> Dropping it hot today. Oh, I got through a little dad joke every now and again. So the Amazon world is interesting. And the what's I, there's so many guys that I keep noticing that are coming in. I think the I think large companies, what they're doing or what they have done in the last three years, is they're coming in and able to buy a hundred thousand units at of a lot of in a lot of categories of a lot of products and or they're just manufacturing it directly in china uh these guys are selling shit so cheap yeah and you know buying real like quality american made products at you know five dollars a unit versus a dollar 20 a unit because you're only buying a thousand or two thousand a time is was so workable like five years ago and it's just it's getting harder and harder to do and the only way to really combat that is branding of course but um like really premium looking branding but some of these guys are actually selling for 10 bucks these really like 20 dollar items for 10 bucks but with good branding too now so it's kind of like how do you get around that besides and it's, so it seems like the only way to really do it is you know, build your loyal following, build your audience first. And even I think uh, what Matt Clark did with Life Boost Coffee was a good something like he sells, you know, $30 coffee for a pound. It is double the price of everybody else. You can, you know, the coffee market was let's go cheaper and for quality and organic, but he sells low acid organic coffee, 30 bucks a pound or 27 bucks a pound, whatever it is. But he actually built everything and built the loyal audience first to have, now he's a hundred million dollar company you know life boost coffee is a hundred million dollar coffee but he built the audience first so and it's kind of interesting that you know the whole idea of of getting onto amazon and launching a product is still workable but getting up to that like 80 units a day or 100 units a day in sales unless it's a total niche like you're filling a hole in the market but it seems like the opt, if you were to really plan out a launch, is build the audience first. Like take the eight months and, you know, side hustle, build an audience, build an audience, build an audience. And so this is basically build a website, build a landing page, 
build lead gen, build the audience and get people engaged in your blogs and what you're talking about stuff. And then you launch your product and then you launch it big because you built, you know, a list of 50,000 people or hundred thousand people. Uh, and if you want to make, cause Amazon's still algorithmic based. So if you want to make a dent in the Amazon world, have a hundred thousand people first before you, before you go in, before you invest into 30, you know, or, and then, and then you can buy your 10,000 units at a cheaper price. Cause now you got a hundred thousand people backing up your 10,000 unit order purchase. If you were to like do a business strategy, like if I want to go and start another Amazon company today, uh, that's the thing that I would do is I would go, okay, I'm going to take eight months to launch this and launch it correctly. I'm going to build uh, a list of 30 or 40,000 people first, uh, then launch. And now I can be $5 or $10 more than everybody else successfully because I can use the algorithmic momentum of Amazon to carry it forward. It's probably how I want to do it. It, take, it takes more time and more planning, but if you have like a job, you basically more just money, spend your say. nights building a list with automated funnels and so on and so forth. Lead gen, lead gen, lead gen, lead gen, lead gen all day. Keep it automated. And it doesn't, you know, lead gen honestly is not that hard. You just get a little spinning wheel and cool rewards and free PDF downloads and, and you just get people opting in and keep them engaged. But it, see, it's so similar to like social media. You have to, like on TikTok, you make a video every day to people engaged. So they, that's what the internet is, you know, it's social media, it's Google, it's get people engaged in your, what your message is. What about, what about that's branding? the way you build, you in, can get hundred million the fastest that way, I think. What about packaging? Like I look at Life Boost and his packaging is just so clean and he, he, he color coordinates everything. And how do you come up with that? packaging that's going to be the differentiator it's really that's the that's the artistic x factor in my opinion not everyone has that that um how do i put it insight or a knack and that's actually something a lot of sellers don't have is like that branding artistic knack is there a way that they can outsource that i guess so you know, it, there are like high level designers out there that you can do that with. I mean, a lot of them are going to charge 1500 to two grand or three grand for like coming up with that coordinated branding. The thing that I would do uh, before even going into that, because you're going to have people that are fake it till you make it guys in that field too. It's going to be easy to be swindled uh, by coming out with a brand that will look artistic and look good, but it won't actually sell. So yeah. I would take, I would do a lot of research and study on art and design. So they, you have to, and that's, I think what I did that was different for a lot of people. Um, and I talked to a lot of artists and learned their process. I was like, why did you choose this color? Why did you choose this font? Why did you choose this design in the back? Why did you choose the, the layout like that? and understanding their thought pattern and getting their references as to why so a lot of it has to do i think with each color will identify with a different audience member each font will identify with a different audience member and so the combination of these things is kind of like chemistry you know if you combine this color this way and this layout with this mood line and this flow pattern and it identifies with this person and so the first, which means the first thing you need to do is pick your audience, pick your, pick your person. Uh, am I targeting a 26 year old girl that's in call, you know, that just finished college and just starting her career? Am I targeting, you know, uh, someone in the black community to, um, you know, hit on their type of hair that they have, right? And then I'm going to target them and would they have a different type of hair than us? So then there's certain products and conditioners and so on and so forth that work better for them. Um, then there's also, you can target uh, athletes and you could target, you know, so, and then if you really narrow it in what type of athlete, you know, is it the bodybuilding, whatever type girl is it just like the planet fitness targets, you know, a lot of uh, overweight people as a gym, which is a great demographic to target, but they really narrowed that down. So, and then based on your person that you pick, you have a, a person in mind. And then now you really communicate that to a designer and they start to pick their colors and fonts based on that person. And then now your brand 
all of a sudden will look super clean. But see, not every brand looks super clean. Look at look at uh, Castiel soap. What's it called? Castiel soap. How do you spell that? It literally is. It's the most crowded label. It's like based on like the angel uh, Castiel Castiel soap. Uh, Cast T L. How do you spell that? I think it's oh. K oh, Dr. Bronner. You mean Dr. Bronner's? Yeah, sorry, uh, Dr. Bronner's. Yeah, yeah, Castiel yeah, yeah, yeah. lavender liquid soap. Look at the look yeah, at yeah. their label and the complexity of it. Yeah, but they built a brand, you know. Um, For sure, they, but yeah, they, they built they a brand uh, and with that design, right? So that design is going to communicate and identify with people. I mean, those are our Bible verses on that label. I know it's some of it almost doesn't make any sense. It seems like it's like nonsensical. Some of it, you know, right. but then, it's, and then, but it identifies, it, it creates identification with a certain audience member. Yeah. So, and it's not, a, I don't think it's a clean looking design. It doesn't look clean. Like no, this is soap, no. and it looks crowded and it looks dirty. Like, but it, but it does, it does, well, it looks clean like a soap. It was interesting the way they branded it. So, um, and you look at other designs that are simple and modern you look it's just you know it's that there's a broad spectrum here so but you have to really narrow down your audience and then pick the fonts the mood lines the the coordination of the design based on that and it gets so the first thing i'd say you need to do is go learn and understand design and art and there's a lot of books that'll just cover like this, this line communicates this, this color communicates this. Like for instance, a stop sign is red, red means stop, right? And so you put red in the label, it's gonna cause people to the subliminal message in it is stop, right? And so there's things like that. And there's like some buy buttons are gonna be red, right? So like stop here or like in the landing pages. So you use colors to create emotions and and that's what when you're just part, you know, freely designing something uh, with not all those things in mind, people don't think about that. But then, and then you have your label, your design, and your whole and all your graphics come out, and they actually are making someone feel a certain way when they're looking at them. Whether it's stop, whether it's go, whether it's slow, whether it's fast, whether it's uh, smooth or you know, creamy or hydration or um, you know, strong, there's like all those, th you can, you can, without using any words, communicate all of those emotions in design and art. That's what artists all try to do. And that's what label design is. That's what your graphics are doing. So if you do it right, you can blow up. Yeah. And then you don't have to play the price game and you're not worried about, you know, competing with overseas competitors who you just have to be better about making the same product and communicating the same product. Maybe it is superior, but you have to really show why it's superior. And that is with an emotional response, right? Right away, emotional response. Because you don't get, yeah, exactly. on Amazon, You, I, I tell people this all the time, on Amazon, you're not able to sit and pitch for five minutes and put the cream on the person's hand like you're at a mall kiosk. You're not, you don't have any access to the individual. The total stranger in your image, your hero image, is 98% of the pitch just to get them to click. And that is 1,000 by 1,000 pixels. And it's between competitors on the left, on the right, above you, below you. So you have to somehow get through that person and get them to click on your listing uh, and not have price be the main driving factor. Otherwise, you're going to lose. And that takes art. That takes aesthetics. It takes uh, emotional response to get the person to actually make that click. And I think that that is an art form. People who can produce those images and stop that person cold in their tracks. It's an That's absolute right. art form. So after that, the, the listing is a piece of cake. After that hero image is nailed, I think the listing all just works itself out. It's true. Exactly. And that's, that is, and it's the toughest thing to accomplish. And that's what where most people fail is the is the artistic like the main image and the label design, and that's the most important. But it's also the least like ninety nine percent of sellers don't put all those thoughts into every little detail of okay this part of the label is going to elicit this response. Okay, this part of the label is going to elicit this response. The label as a whole is going to make you feel 
you know, this way. So, like, if pull up uh, Bondi Boost. What Give boost? Me an example of this. Bondi Boost, called B O N D I Boost. You can do a, share, a screen share of that. I'm going to give a, a great example of a design to make you feel a certain way or under, or subliminally communicate something a certain way. Yeah, go ahead and pull up the first listing you see there, that uh, Bondi Boost HG. Okay, so I'm going to say a couple of comments. Uh, this is, it says HG shampoo and HG conditioner. Now, in the world of beauty, if you, you can't really say hair growth because it, you, unless you have a drug like minoxidil, right? And so, and, and nowhere on this label does it say hair growth or regrowth. Mm. Mm. But when you look at this label, like go back to the main image for a second. The first thing you see is HG, hair growth, subliminal, right? Very clever the way they did that. And then mm. now you have, you read from left to right. So you have before and after. So now on a mood line, downward means something's going wrong, it's going bad, uh, sadness. And then you have a mood line going upward on the right. So you read from left to right means your hair is going down and now your hair is going up. Interesting. But all of this is subliminal. It's not, it's not plainly said. You don't need to use words for this. This is a clever designer. He did this very simply and go, I'm going to communicate uh, your hair was going down and now it's going up and I'm going to communicate that it's hair growth without actually saying hair growth. But when they did use a word in that particular case, a subliminal word, HG, but perfect example of a very, very clever design. This is a giant brand. Wow. Giant. Yeah, he doesn't say hair. He doesn't say the word growth in any of the listing. That's right. I think one of our other uh, podcasts we did, we talked about, you know, tell me it's not a, uh, a male enhancement with, you know, yeah. or uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell me, tell me it's, it's not a without telling me it's male enhancement, right? Tell me yeah, it's exactly. hair growth without telling me it's hair growth. Yeah. It's yeah. art. And that's the cleverness of, of a good artist is you can say things without saying things, especially when you're when you're hovering in a gray zone of hair growth like that, right? Or you want to make outrageous claims, but you can't use the words. HG. So use the art to make your claims. So you're saying that the dick pill guys should call themselves DP. <laughs> sure, yeah. Exactly. Dick pills, <laughs> DP. DP. I love it. I love and then, it, man. and then you know what? Have a uh, have a you know some kind of mood line going down and a mood line going up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is you before. You know, honestly, if you made a pill this like that, after. yeah, you 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 got all of it without saying any of it. I love it. All right. Well, this was another very insightful episode of the Selling on Amazon Pod. Thanks for uh, hanging with me today, and. Um, Thanks for, I'm talking to the audience now. Thanks for hanging with us today. I hope you learned something and uh, keep the kangaroos out of your pool. That's the, uh, yeah. that's the big takeaway here today. Oh, and no snakes in your pants. That's the other big yeah, takeaway. No snakes in your pants. Yeah. All right, Michael. All right. Peace Cheers, out, brother. Bye-bye.